Oh, the other announcement is Blake is sick. Is your dad sick or just taking off? No, he's like food poisoning sick. Oh, oh, get back. <laughs> I am. Listen, I am eating well. So right now I do not want food poisoning because I could be sick for weeks. It is good stuff. Well, Blake is, is not well. Linda is running the media. So we pray this little thing works well and doesn't mess up. And Debbie's on vacation. So Carlton has agreed to lead us in our singing. And so we are so grateful for that. We have a birthday today. Sherry Kitterer isn't here. I... Okay, let's all go say happy birthday. That would be the place to be. Well, she's having a birthday today at the beach. And one that I missed, uh, Maria Welch was telling me that Delaney was six years old on Thursday the 23rd. So happy birthday to Delaney. <laughs> And I was saying my granddaughter is going to be six next month. So, hey, that's my youngest. My oldest is like 26. Okay, if um, <laughs> we'd love to know who's worshiping with us, if you'd fill out that little form. It's in the black pad at the end of the pew and pass it down. We make mats for the homeless and more from one to four on Monday. Weight Watchers meets here in the fellowship hall on Tuesday. Intercessory prayer Wednesday at 11. And we'll begin our Wednesday evening study this next Wednesday. Not this Wednesday. I mean, Wednesday. When, ooh, I better start working on that. This Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, I'll call Carlton, I'm sick from treatment. Can you lead? The, nah. Now, I'm excited about the study, and I hope you'll come and join us. Our men's group is meeting Thursday, 11.30 at Woody's Bar and Grill. Two adult Sunday school classes. Just a reminder, Word Sunday school class and Journey. Hmm? <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> uh, I am not going to be here. <laughs> They're going to start coming in asking me questions all over the place. Okay, I'm going to have to do two studies, one on Revelation and one on Max Lucado's book. We have Sunday Fun Day from kids 4 to 11 years of age. Next Sunday from 1 to 3.30. You do, if you are a child, you do not want to miss this. This is loads of fun. What did I say? What did I say? Okay, show up at 1.30 or 1 or whenever you want to. Yeah, just be here. Uh, anything special they need to know, Linda? Yeah, and it really, it is, it's fantastic. It's fun. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? If not, then let us worship God.
I invite you to share with me in the call to worship. We have entered into the season of Lent. Today we remember the temptations Jesus faced. Let us pray. Merciful God, we're here on this first Sunday in Lent in preparation. We're preparing for this wilderness time of examination. We're here to examine our thoughts, actions, and motives. We will be tested to follow the wrong master. We want to learn to make good choices. We're here in expectation. We know that you're with us in this place and during this season. We know you have something to say to us. You will guide us on our journey. We're here in celebration. We know that Christ has paid the price for our sin and walks with us every day. Guide us as we worship. Bless us when we leave. This is our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Oops. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest, Peace and good tidings on earth. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Sting alone in the desert, tell of the days that are past. How for our sins he was tempted, yet was triumphant at last. Tell of the years of his labor. Tell of the sorrow he bore. He was despised and afflicted, homeless, rejected, and poor. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, <coughs> writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him. Tell
You may be seated while the children come forward for their special time. Amen. Oh, I can get down there. <laughs> I just can't get back up. Satan came and tempted Jesus to do things Jesus knew weren't right. But just because Jesus is God and he's powerful, that doesn't mean the things Satan suggested weren't tempting. Like first, Satan suggested that Jesus turn stone into bread so that Jesus could eat. Being out in the wilderness for 40 days without food, I think a, a rock might start to look mighty hungry or mighty tasty. Jesus could have easily done what Satan suggested. But he didn't. Instead, he answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone. Then Satan took Jesus up to a very high place and showed him a worldly kingdoms below. He said, all of this belongs to me. I will give it to you. Jesus answered, this temptation. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Next, Satan took Jesus to Jerusalem and led him up to the highest point on the temple. He said to Jesus, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here and God will send his angels to rescue you. Of course, God could keep Jesus safe, but Jesus quoted scripture and said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And do you know what the devil did? He backed up. He gave up and said, I'll come back and try another day. The next time the devil tempts you, any one of us here, turn to the Bible. Look in the Bible and see what the Bible says, and then do what Jesus said. Answer Satan with scripture. Let us pray. Dear God, help us use your word and follow Jesus' example in our lives and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> what a wonderful change has been. And my life has been wrought. Since Jesus came into my heart, I have lied in my soul for which long I have sought. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into. 
into my heart. Floods of joy o'er my soul, like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I have ceased from my wandering and go wing astray. Since Jesus came into my heart, and my sins, which were many, are all washed away. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart. Joy o'er my soul, like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, there's a light in the valley of death now for me. Since Jesus came into my heart, and the gates of the city beyond. I can see since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Lots of joy o'er my soul, like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. You may be seated. The offertory invitation is taken from the sixth chapter of Matthew, where Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. With these words of our Lord in mind, let us worship now with the giving of our gifts to God. Mm.
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Precious Lord, please forgive us for our selfish ambitions, holding on to our time and money as though it were ours. We know that it all belongs to you. We recognize that everything we enjoy is a gift from you. It is only by your mercies that are new every morning that we're blessed. Thank you for investing so much in us and in this world. There is no one who can love us like you do. Help us to focus our priorities and our thoughts on heavenly things and placing our treasures in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Our scripture this morning is Luke's account of the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. So I invite you to listen. Listen for the Word of God to you. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their territory and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And let us once again go to God in prayer. And as we do, I'll remind you of the prayer concerns printed on the back of the bulletin. Uh, Mike Bradshaw is going to have cataract surgery on the 28th. Uh, Louis DeMaster, John Shipley, Atticus Williams are all, all have health concerns. Atticus is doing okay. But we ask that you lift them all up in your prayers. And I think I mentioned Ed Norman to you last week, but in case I didn't, a brother-in-law of Judy Norman uh, had a hard cath on the 16th that he is dealing with other health issues and she has asked that we pray for him. If you have anyone you would like to let us know about, uh, you're invited to say their name out loud as we first go to God silently in prayer And that I will lead in the pastoral prayer. Let us go to God.
Oh God, we find ourselves tempted so often. How lonely that experience is. Suddenly, we have to decide whether to say yes or no. And nobody is in worship then, and we're not singing hymns then. And the right decision isn't easy. It's ours to make, and all our best instincts are tested. Has the seed of decency been planted deeply enough inside us? Then it can hold out. In these solitary moments of testing, be with us. We can't know where a careless step thoughtlessly taken might lead us. Paths that look so good sometimes lead to so much misery. So make us stop and think. And Father, if our mistakes do lead us to the far country, help us to come to ourselves just long enough to head back home, knowing that you will stand ready at the door, ready to welcome us back. Be with those whose hardest testing comes this week. Show us ways to bring courage to them along with hope and discipline. And guard us, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It was a life-changing, ministry-altering moment. A decision had to be made. Would he follow the devil or would he follow God? Would he adopt a demonic style of power and leadership? Or would he adopt a divine style of power and leadership? And our souls hung in the balance of the decision that he would make. And don't think for a second that this was only something that affected a man by the name of Jesus over 2,000 years ago. It is just as relevant today as it was back then because those same choices are placed before us just about every day of our lives. Who are we going to follow? Are we going to adopt a demonic style of power and leadership? Or are we going to adopt a divine style of power and leadership? Okay, what's the difference between the two? Well, there are a lot. But let me give you a really oversimplification. A demonic style of power and leadership is self-centered. A divine style of power and leadership is Christocentric. It is Christ-centered. Demonic, selfish. Divine, selfless. And think about that because you decide in your marriage, in your relationship, what kind of power you're going to use. What kind of leadership you will exert. Will it be demonic or will it be divine? In this church, in any church, we make that decision. In your business, you make that decision. When we elect our Government leaders, it is the same decision. Who do we want to lead our country? What kind of leadership style do we want to follow? It is an extremely important decision. Now, most of us chose Jesus as our Savior years ago. Some of us decades ago, and I think most of you have. 
But have you chosen Him as your Lord? Have you chosen Him as your Master? Have you chosen Him as your leader? Now you can choose Him as your Savior, and your eternal destiny is secure. That is our theological position. You do not have to choose Him as your Lord, as your Master, as your leader. You can follow other leaders. You can follow what I am calling the demonic. Now you're saved eternally, but that's why we also say we need to be saved every day from the things that seek to destroy us, our families, our churches, our businesses, our nation, and the world. And you can see that battle taking place every time you turn on the news, every time you read a newspaper. Now for Jesus, it was an extremely important moment. And it's set up by something that happened before. What happens immediately before this moment? He is baptized by John in the Jordan. Wait, what? Why? <laughs> Why was he baptized by John in the Jordan? What was John's baptism a symbol of? Repentance of sin. Jesus was sinless. Why was he baptized by John in the Jordan? Well, John raised the same question, didn't he? He said, whoa, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You don't need to be baptized by me. I need to be baptized by you. And it, that was certainly true, although Jesus never baptized anybody that we know of. But Jesus wouldn't have any of it. No. So why? Why was he baptized by John in the Jordan? Why did he do that? Well, to identify with our humanity, he humbled himself. But I also think it was symbolic of what is going to happen at the end of these 40 days of Lent. What is going to happen on Good Friday? The weight, the sin of the whole world is going to be upon Him. So yes, I think it was an appropriate thing to do. And then the heavens open up and God says, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And then... This is what happens. We begin our scripture reading, Luke 4, 1 and 2. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. I mean, it was a really wonderful time for him after the baptism and the heavens opening. Left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. And at the end of them, he was hungry, which I think is an understatement. I can't even, I have never fasted. I have never gone four days without, much, without food, much less 40. There are two things I want to bring out in that passage. And the first one is I use Luke's description of what happened over against Matthew's description of what happened. Because in Matthew, it says that he was led by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. And the question is often raised, does God tempt us? Does God, and he doesn't, lead us rather into temptation? And my response is usually Matthew's. Yeah, that's what it says in Matthew. But you're theologically correct if you say no. According to this passage, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where, just matter-of-factly, he was tempted by the devil, but that temptation was important. It would decide how his ministry was going to be conducted. The second thing out of that verse, <laughs> I keep pointing to the scripture I can see. I think our greatest temptations come when we're worn out, when we're tired, when we're at the end of our rope, when we're hungry, when we're under stress, when we're rested, full, happy, we're not really tempted to do anything that we shouldn't do. It is in our down moments. And it was the perfect time for the devil to come in and go, okay, here is my chance before his ministry begins to have an impact on what is going to happen because I can thwart the plans of God. I can get him, Jesus, 
to do what I want him to do. That is my plan. Now I'm going to ask you, what do you fear? I mean, just think about it in, in your own mind. Now they say our greatest fear is rejection and our greatest need is acceptance. But I mean, what, what do you fear? Do you fear sickness? Surgery? Radiation? Do you fear financial breakdown? Do you fear relationship issues? When you're thinking about, you know, what's the first thing that pops into your mind, how many of you thought sin? What I fear the most is being tempted to do something that I just shouldn't do. That's not a fear. It's not a worry. It's not a concern. Somebody made the comment, and it's in the outline, is your devil too small? And by that, this minister meant, do you underestimate the power of temptation? Do you underestimate the power of sin to destroy your life? And I think almost unanimously, most of us would say, yeah, because I don't worry about it. At all, until, <laughs> until, and then you fall into the trap. So, is your devil too small? Do you really worry about it? And if you don't, why not? And perhaps you should <laughs> begin to kind of think about it. Now, sometimes I think we can make our devil too big and worry about it too much. You can go to the other extreme where if anything bad happens, the devil did it. Well, I don't believe that. I think most of the things we do ourselves, and we are very capable. And somebody said there's a difference between temptation and testing, and I'm not sure I really buy into that, but he said temptation is something you will like. It tempts you to do something you will enjoy. A test is something you will not like and that I do agree with okay let's think about the temptations we're going to walk through them stones into bread and I'm going to get you to read the part of Jesus and I'll read the part of the devil it's typecasting so <laughs> Luke 4 3 through 4 the devil said to him if you are the son of God tell this stone to become bread and Jesus answered it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Now the interesting thing is there is nothing wrong with what the devil is tempting Jesus to do. In all three temptations, there is nothing wrong with any of them in and of themselves because Jesus ends up doing all three of those things, only better, only on steroids. And I, hopefully I'll remember to give you an example each time of how he does that. But it's not what he is suggesting, but why. What is the philosophy behind it? And you want to believe what is the theology behind it? Who are you going to follow? Who is going to be your leader? Who is going to be your master? Because doesn't he go... Doesn't he do this on steroids with the feeding of the 5,000? I mean, he doesn't turn one little stone into bread. He feeds 5,000 families with five loaves and two fish. Now, the other interesting thing, as he decides how his ministry is going to be conducted, of all the miracles Jesus performed, and he performed a lot of miracles, he never performed a miracle for himself divine style of power and leadership, selfless. This, feed yourself. You're hungry. Feeding of 5,000, did he feed them because he was hungry? I'm sure he was. No. He could have waited till they left and fed himself. He did it because they were hungry. I mean, that was the point. It is selfless use of power and a selfless style of leadership that he had. And the physical temptation, and, it's, and really Jesus focused on the spiritual, and we'll get to that a little bit later, but it was the physical temptation. On temptation, I'm going to share something with you that I've shared with you before, 
when I've talked about temptation is quoting Charles Allen on temptation. And I think if you weren't here, I think it's something you need to hear. And if you were, it's good to hear again. Because when I read it, I hadn't thought about it in quite this way. When he thinks about temptation as a fork in the road, and you have decisions to make, where one must decide the direction to take, an action to carry out, a character to be. A mother whose son has been killed may be tempted to become bitter and harsh. One who is facing a difficult life situation may be tempted to escape by getting drunk. One who is destined to a bed of suffering or the chair of an invalid may be tempted to self-pity. When someone has treated us unfairly, there is the temptation to hate, to spite, or resentment. One who has prospered is tempted to vanity and self-love. The successful is tempted to seek undue power. A person is no stronger than their weakest moment. And every person has an Achilles heel, a point of vulnerability. We cannot escape temptation because we are endowed with the freedom of choice. And since no person has an iron will, everyone is in danger of falling. We can choose between good and evil, between being true and false, between being brave and cowardly, between being generous and selfish. And the very freedom of choice becomes itself temptation. Now let me also say, and this is really parenthetically and doesn't really have a whole lot to do with the sermon, but I don't want you to turn me off during the sermon. If you don't believe in the devil literally, think of the devil as a, a symbol of evil because we all believe in evil. We know, think of it in those terms. And we know that sin exists in the world. We know that evil, and it comes into our lives in a lot of different ways. So don't be put off, if you don't believe literally, in the devil by the use of the term that the Bible uses. Think of it as a metaphor. Serving the wrong master. Boy, is this easy to do. Luke 4, 5 through 8. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I will give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. An interesting thing here about this, this fork in the road and following the wrong leader. Uh, John Bailey said, I am sure that the bit of road that most requires to be illuminated is the point where it forks. And there is this difficult moment when we have to make that decision, don't we? Yes or no, to be faithful or unfaithful. What are we going to do? What are we going to say? How are we going to act? Now, the devil is called the prince of the world. And that's why he says all of the kings of the world are mine. They're all mine. And you know, God has not been doing a really good job of taking care of this world. But this is my world. I know how things work here. And with my know-how and your clout, your power, can you imagine all the wonderful things we could do? And the devil wouldn't have been wrong in saying any of those things. But, obviously, Jesus said, no, that is, I, I am not worshiping power. I am not worshiping getting an earthly kingdom, earthly accolades. That's not where it is for me. And so, but he does this, doesn't he? At the end of the 40 days of Lent, we go through Holy Week, where we have the crucifixion, the death, burial, resurrection of our Lord. 
And then we have the ascension where he goes and he sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And then he is what? King of kings and Lord of lords. And all the kingdoms belong to him. Spiritual kingdom. He was not in it for a physical kingdom, much to the dismay of Judas, and I think to the dismay of most of the disciples. That's what they were expecting. That's what they wanted. That's not what it was about. And that decision was made back at the beginning before he ever started his ministry. He was focusing on that which was spiritual. And, you know, and, and either literally or metaphorically, the devil was defeated and demoted on Holy Saturday. That's what we say, right? Okay, he's no longer in control. He wasn't eliminated. Uh, now, he is a created being, if you believe in him literally, which means he has a beginning and an end. So does he still exist? I don't know. But if he doesn't, he's got lots of little helpers running around. Can you think of a demonic style of power and leadership? Can you think of an example? The war in Ukraine. Now, the reason for the war itself probably wasn't bad. Trying to secure his borders to make sure he was safe, his country was safe, to expand his territory, to strengthen his economic and military might, in and of itself is not sinful because we do that or we've done it throughout our history. That wasn't the problem. What was the problem? How he did it. The end does not justify the means. It does not justify attacking civilians, attacking civilian targets, hospitals, schools, nurseries, I mean, it is absolutely horrible. And what the Ukrainians are doing is all defensive. They have never tried to do to Russia what Russia is doing to them. They have not invaded Russia. They haven't tried to target their capital, their leaders. They are simply defending themselves. And that is a demonic style of leadership. Do you think he could have expanded his borders in a different way? Amen, absolutely. I believe there are a lot of other ways he could have done it, but chose not to because he is following. Now, he may be saved. He says he's a Christian, right? But he's following the wrong master, in my opinion. He is going in the wrong direction. All you have to do is t <laughs> turn on the television, watch the news every night, and you'd see a demonic style of power and leadership. Hate crimes. If we don't like your ethnicity, what you believe, where you worship, we won't debate you. We won't love you and talk to you about it. We'll hurt you. We'll kill you. We'll bomb you. If I have a disagreement with somebody in the office, I won't try to work through that to try to bring about a reconciliation. Well, I'll just walk into a break room and start shooting people. If I don't like somebody's comment, to me. I'll try to run them off the road. I'll try to pull out a gun. Mass shootings. If that's not demonic, well, you have, we know, right? We know what a demonic style of power and leadership is. And the last one is something we do a lot. <laughs> okay. Something I do a lot. Testing God. Okay, let's, it's a little longer, but 4 through 9. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. For they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. How many times have I said that? If you really are God, only that one I actually don't say. If you really do love me, 
If you really do care about me, then why don't you... And you fill in the blank. Have you ever said that? And then if he doesn't answer your prayer in the way you want it, how you want it, when you want it, you get mad at him. Okay, what style is that self-centered? It's not very selfless, is it? If we get tired of waiting for an answer because it's taking too long and we get mad at God, and we all do this, or I'm assuming I'm not the only one who does that, you're following the wrong master. You're being led down the wrong road. And there are a lot of people whose faith has been completely taken from them because God doesn't answer a prayer the way they want it to be answered. Okay, you should worship God only. Don't worship yourself, your wishes, your wants, your desires. Just because you want it doesn't mean you're going to get it. And we can all manipulate Scripture to make it mean whatever we want it to mean. And we're taught not to do that. I'm looking at Carlton and Vernon. We're taught not to do that. But we're also taught, we all go to the Bible with a bias. And we're going to find those passages we agree with. And we're going to kind of ignore those passages that we disagree with. And whatever we want to assert as our position, we can find it if we work hard enough. We've done this through, throughout our nation's history. But we've been kind of, since the fall, we have all been lured into following a demonic style of leadership and power. It is something that comes naturally. And as I've said before, I think it is supernatural for you not to do it. And for you to try to suspend your belief system and read the Bible with an open mind. Now sometimes I talked about critical evaluation. And, and sometimes I think we've forgotten how to critically evaluate anything, and I said that last week. But then it occurred to me, we have forgotten how to think independently. We group think. We will believe whatever the group we like the most believes. And if they believe it, we're going to buy into it 100%. Whether it's true or not. Whether it's real or not. It doesn't mean you have to dislike your group if you dislike something that group is saying with which you disagree. And it's also true in denominations, in churches. You're not going to agree with everything I'm going to say. If you do, you're not thinking critically. <laughs> You need to evaluate anything any minister in any pulpit says and make sure it aligns with what you believe. Don't believe it's the Word of God just because a pastor or a Sunday school teacher or somebody you really admire and respect says it. It may be, but it may not be because the devil, evil, can manipulate Scripture. Our human desires can manipulate Scripture. Now, how he did this on steroids, this jump from the pinnacle of the temple and you're not going to be hurt if you are the Son of God. What did, what was one of the things that was shouted to Jesus as he hung on the cross? Wasn't it a soldier who shouted, if you are who you say you are, just get yourself down from there. You would have the power. You would have the divine power to get down if you really were the Son of God, which he was. It wasn't that he didn't have the divine power to get down off the cross. What it was, he had the divine power to stay on that cross. Because I guarantee you any human would have been off. If I could have had the power to get myself off that cross, I would have done it. I would have been out of there. He could have stopped that process any time he wanted to. He didn't have to go through the scourging. He didn't have to go through the crucifixion. But the divine power of love kept him on that cross. Why did he do that for you? He did it for me. Now we... We are all on a journey through Lent. We're all on a journey through life. 
And those same two choices are constantly being placed before us. Who are you going to follow? Are you going to follow the devil? Or are you going evil? Or are you going to follow God? Are you going to follow Jesus? What style of power and leadership are you going to develop in your life? Is it going to be a demonic style or a divine style? Who will you follow? Who will you serve? Let us pray. Mighty God, we bow before you, grateful for your presence in our lives and asking for your strength to help us to always make the right choices. Most of us have surrendered our lives to you as, as our Savior, and we hold on to that dearly. Help us to continue to invite you into our hearts, into our lives, into our actions, into our motives as our Master as our Lord, as the one leading our lives. This is our desire and prayer, left, lifted through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'm going to invite you to affirm your faith with me uh, by reading in unison the Apostles' Creed. So would you stand as we affirm our faith together? <clears throat> Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, I do extend the invitation to you as you go through, not just this week, but go through the season of Lent. It's a time of self-examination. And as you begin to examine your thoughts, desires, motives, actions, just ask yourself the question that Duncan raised. What would Jesus do? Are you developing which style of leadership and power are you developing and using? in your life. Is it demonic or is it divine? I also extend the invitation. If there's anyone here who has not surrendered their life to Jesus Christ, and if you have felt the movement of God's Spirit within you, and if you would like to profess your faith publicly, and I would love to talk to you if you'd like to do it privately, but if you'd like to do it publicly, you're invited to do that as we sing hymn number 497. If you will only let God guide you and hope in Him through all your ways, whatever comes, He'll stand beside you to bear you through 
the evil days who trust in God's unchanged in love builds on a rock that can't be moved only be still and wait his leisure in cheerful hope with heart content to take whatever father's pleasure and all discerning love have sent. And now may God's love give you confidence and his truth give you direction. May God's eternalness give you peace and hope this day and all your days. Amen.